Our scripture reading for today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 3 to 10. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Val. Mahalo kiokua. Aloha mai kako. Aloha. Okay, uh, I think we can do a little better than that. So I think you guys are turning pages. So let's try that again. Aloha mai kako. Excellent. Just want to make sure that you're awake, you're, you're paying attention, that you're good. Okay, so we, as I said in the pastor's welcome, we are in the middle of our sermon series. The Bible doesn't say that. And because this, the reading that uh, Val just read for us is still fresh in your mind, I want to jump right in because today we're looking at the phrase, the thought that God, the Bible doesn't say that God wants me to be happy. God wants you to be happy. And before we proceed, I just want to clarify, the Bible doesn't say that God doesn't want us to be happy or want you or me to be happy. Like, right? Oh, wow, thank God. Okay, at least there's there's a chance. Get chance, right? Right? No? Yeah, there is. Thank you, Noel. (laughs) But it's not God's end goal. It's not his purpose for our lives. It's actually just a byproduct of something else which we'll get to. So who who is familiar with the passage that Val just read for us? Who's familiar? Okay, a bunch of us. Okay, so let me ask. Okay, what's that? What's this passage called again? The The Beatitudes. Who's talking? Who's who's giving the the discourse? Jesus. Jesus is. Okay, what's the occasion? Anybody know? I'm sorry? Sermon on the Mount, it is, and it's the longest discourse, it's his longest teaching, Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. It's all one reading, okay? So I would encourage you to read it if, you, if you're not familiar with it, okay? But did, but did you notice what Jesus was saying, right? So this is Jesus. He's talking to the crowds. He's talking to the Pharisees and to, to the leaders of, of Jerusalem, uh, of Israel at this time. And all the people who just came out in droves. So context-wise, Jesus has been performing miracles. So everybody's just excited. Like he's healing the sick, the lame, the blind. And everybody's like wants to know what's going on. Okay? So as they've gathered, Jesus is using this opportunity. And, And notice what Jesus is saying. He said, blessed. Right? Blessed. God's special favor is upon the poor in spirit. God's favor, his, his special touch is upon those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who are merciful. Right? He, he doesn't say that God's favor and blessing, which is contrary to what everybody was thinking at the time, because no, 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 God's favor is upon the rich. God's favor is upon the wealthy, the landowners. God's, that's what every, the crowd was thinking. But Jesus is saying, no, no, no. God's favor is upon those who aren't what you think. So how in the world did, did, did we get from the Beatitudes, okay, blessed are the poor in spirit, to God wants me to be happy? Think about that. Which uh, at this time I'd like to include, you know, God wants me to have You fill in the blank, whatever it is. God wants me to have a new life. God wants me to have a new wife because I want a new life, right? God wants, or husband, okay? God wants me to have a new car or a new house, a new job. Because all of us, every single one of us in here, we have our own little thing that that either we we secretly, we we hold on to, or even overtly, we, we profess, we name it and claim it, and then we, we want this to happen. And if this would happen in our lives, then, only then, would we truly be happy. 
Yeah, sort of, sort of like hoping that God was like a genie in a lamp, which reminds me of a joke about the husband and wife who, who were in their 60s about to celebrate their 30th wedding anniversary. Knowing, knowing that his wife loved antiques, the husband went out and bought her a beautiful antique brass oil lamp. When she unwrapped it, you know, she must have rubbed it, and then a genie appeared, just suddenly appeared. The genie thanked them for setting him free, and he was willing to grant each of them one wish. So the wife wished for an all-expense-paid, first-class, around-the-world cruise for her and her husband. And Shazam! The, she was presented with tickets and the, for the entire journey, plus the side trips and, and dinners and shopping and all of that. So now it was the husband's turn. And, and, and with a sly grin on his face, he wished that his wife was 30 years younger than him because when, when they first got married, hey, she was, you know, she was pretty hot. She was a looker, right? So, so the genie said, no problem, shazam! And the husband instantly was turned into uh, 93 years old. <laughs> because that's the, pro- that's the problem with wanting or getting something without first developing the character to appreciate the gift, right? As Max Kaufman, um, actor, said, I quote, uh, I never knew what real happiness was until I got married. And by then, it was too late. End (laughs) end quote, okay. See, See, that's our challenge. The world thinks happiness, joy, and blessedness comes from improving our circumstances. Right? Think about it. Like having a satisfying marriage or a relationship. Or, or if I, I just get that promotion and advance my career. Or, or if I get into that right school, that right college, or that right um, master's program. Or, or having health, right? For those of us who are, who are aging and, and are, are ailing, like physically, I, I may not look it, but I am. I, every morning, I, I wake up with my back is just... just yeah, it's just... And, and I feel the pain in my joints every morning. Right? Or, 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 you know, maybe for some of us who are, who are looking to our future, who are having children, or, or whatever it is, the world, the world chases after these things, thinking that once they obtain their goals, okay, once we, once we achieve this certain income level or, or this lifestyle, and then, then we'll be happy. And especially it's true for us Americans, right? Because even our Declaration of Independence promises us the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? And that's why commercials on TV or or via the internet and advertisements give us the impression that just by purchasing their products, not only will we fulfill that need in our life, but we'll also satisfy our ultimate desire, which is to be happy. If we buy that new car, then we'll be happy. If, if we take that vacation, their vacation, and sit on the beach in the sun, then you'll be happy. Or if we go on that ultra slim fast diet and lose that 10 pounds, then we'll be happy. All right? Buy our product and then you will be happy. It's as simple as that. But the real question is, will we really? Will we really be happy if we purchase that item? Or will we just be thinner and tanner, but still be unhappy people who just happen to be driving around in a new car? Because if you really think about it, so many of the things we do to find happiness are ultimately unsatisfying. They may give us brief moments of satisfaction, temporary relief, but ultimately things don't deliver the happiness that we thought that we'd get. And that's why Jesus, the Son of God, turned the world upside down 2,000 years ago by saying that the blessed, that the truly happy people are those who have a relationship with God and are in his kingdom. That's what the Beatitudes is teaching us. See, Jesus understood that the pursuit of happiness would not satisfy that empty void within our hearts. 
And that's why Jesus was able to say that. To say to someone who is poor in spirit or who is mourning or who is being persecuted that you are blessed. Because as Jesus explained, for you have the kingdom of God. For you will be comforted by God. Let me illustrate my point with the story of, of three men, an, an Englishman, a Frenchman, and a, and a Russian, who were discussing the meaning of happiness. Okay? The, the first, uh, the Frenchman first, no, sorry, the Englishman began by saying, happiness is when you return home tired after a, a long day at work and you find your slippers warming by the fire. You English have no romance, said the Frenchman. Happiness is having dinner with a beautiful woman at a French, fine French restaurant. The Russian piped in and said, you're both wrong. You see, true happiness is when you are at home in bed and at four, four o'clock in the morning, you hear hammering at the door and there stand the secret police saying to you, Vladimir Ivanovich, you are under arrest. And you say, sorry, Vladimir Ivanovich lives next door. <laughs> See, because true happiness, true happiness doesn't come from what you own or what you're doing. Joy, happiness comes from who you are. And glad that you're not Vladimir, right? <laughs> and being a child of God, being a child of God, being a part of God's kingdom, being in a relationship with him, is essential to being and feeling blessed because everything else is just temporary. So if the Bible doesn't say that God wants us to be happy, what does the Bible say that God wants for us? Well, straight from the Bible, it says that God wants us to be holy for he is holy in the book of Peter because being sanctified, right? Hopefully you've heard this sometime over the past three and a half years that I've been here, okay? Being sanctified, being set apart, apart for God's purposes, becoming holy, all, all the same thing, sanctified, set apart, holiness, all the same thing, is God's will for our lives. Like I said, you know this, I've been preaching this for three and a half years, and the good news, the gospel, is that Jesus does the sanctifying. We can't do it on our own. Holiness is a gift of grace that God manifests within us through his Holy Spirit. Let me, let me explain with a short story from the book of Isaiah. Okay. So Isaiah tells us that he has a vision where he is transported, taken to heaven, and standing. Actually, he's cowering before the Almighty God, the creator of the he heavens and the earth. Why is he cowering? Because he knows. He knows that he is a sinful man. And in other words, because he's not holy, he knows what will happen to the sinner, the impure that enters the presence of the holy God, that he's going to die, drop dead before God. But instead of suffering the consequences as he deserves, God sends a seraphim, a heavenly creature with the burning hot coal to touch Isaiah's lips. And with the coal... The seraphim tells him, after touching his lips, tells him, your guilt is taken away from you. Your sin is atoned for. You are forgiven. In the same way, Jesus, the Son of God, came from heaven and manifested his holiness, the kingdom of God, here on earth, and everything, and everyone he touched was healed, became pure sanctified, just like Isaiah was in the temple of God by the piece of coal that touched his lips. And after, and after Jesus was crucified, okay, resurrected, and then he ascended to heaven, he, Jesus, sent the Holy Spirit to heal, to comfort, but also empower his followers to do the same thing that he did to be his vessel, his conduit, so that streams of living water, sound familiar, right? Waiokeola, waters of life, would pour forth into all of the world. 
See, the Bible doesn't say that God wants us to be happy. The Bible tells us, teaches us that God wants us to be holy because He is holy. God is holy. But our challenge can be summed up with the following joke about the pastor who decided to use an object lesson, a visual demonstration to emphasize his point in his sermon. See, so the pastor brought out four worms and four different jars, and he placed one worm in each jar. The first worm was placed in a container of alcohol, whiskey. Okay? The second worm was placed into a container of cigarette smoke. The third worm was put into a container of chocolate syrup. And the fourth worm was put into a container of pure, clean soil, earth, soil, right? As at the conclusion of the sermon, the pastor reported the following results. He said that the first worm placed in, in the whiskey died. The second worm that was placed in the, the cigarette smoke also died. The third worm that was placed in the chocolate syrup, two died. All three of them died. The fourth worm that was placed in the pure, clean, good soil was alive and thriving. So the pastor asked the congregation, what can you learn from this demonstration? And a little old woman in the back quickly raised her hand and, started sh- and shouted out, as long as you drink, smoke, and eat chocolate, you won't have worms. <laughs> which is true, which is true. It is true. But our, our challenge, our challenge is not against flesh and blood, as the, as the Apostle Paul explains to us. Well, maybe a little flesh, but, okay, but okay, that's, I digress. So our challenge, our challenge is that every Sunday, as I, as I preach one sermon, one message, there are 50 to 60 or however, however many people are in here, different interpretations of what I just said and how it applies to your life. See, th- this whole series is about, um, the purpose, again, of this series is about to address and, and correct bad theology that has crept its way into today's church and become a part of who we are and what we believe. And what we believe manifests itself in our actions. Do you guys understand what I just said? What we truly believe, whether it's true or not, and you can listen to one of my earlier sermons where I talk about what I believed was true and my, that manifested itself in my actions and I, I made a fool out of myself. But whether it's true or not, okay, if we believe it, we're, that's what's going to drive our actions. Okay? And as, as I uh, said, uh, God didn't say that he wants us to be happy biblically, okay? But God didn't say that he doesn't want us to be happy. God's real purpose, his end goal is that he wants us to be holy. And in our pursuit of holiness, we will find contentment. We will find peace, patience, joy, and actually manifest happiness. How do we become holy? How do we become sanctified, fulfill God's will for our lives? By growing in our relationship with God because we can't do it on our own. That's the good news. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus gives us his holiness, right? Like the streams of living water, like the coal, the burning coal from Isaiah. God gives us his holiness. We don't do it on our part, but we engage. We have to do our part. We don't drive it, but we do participate. And when we engage, how do, you, how do you grow in your relationship with God? Well, by spending time with Him. How do you grow in your relationship with your spouse or your significant other or your friends? You spend time with them. You know, and as I've been saying, the best way that I know how is by, is by praying and, and reading the Bible. And that's why we, we go through the trouble of producing these Bible bookmarks for you. Actually, Joy does. The, the <laughs> so we can thank Joy for... <laughs> making these for, for us. She goes through the process of printing and then cutting. And actually, I have a, another volunteer who does the, the formatting of it. But we think it's that important. Every month, we go through this, this challenge so that you would start reading. Start, don't, it's a three-year 
program, Bible program, Bible reading program. Five minutes a day, a chapter a day. You, you read a chapter a day for three years and a little more, like a quarter, then you get through the Bible. My, my whole thing is, if you start reading the Bible, I believe that the Holy Spirit in you will connect you to God, and you will get excited, and you're going to read faster than the three-year program. You're going to want to read through. If, as I said, and I'm going to keep saying, if you ever hit a roadblock in your reading, you're like, oh, that's kind of, um, I don't want to call it boring because the Word of God is not boring, but for you it may be and it may be a challenge for you to read it and you don't understand it, skip it. I would rather you continue reading than just stop. Start with the New Testament. If you've never read the Bible before, start with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the book of Acts. From there, you can read through the rest of the New Testament. You know, but it's good to know, not just know the Bible, but to know God. And the best way to do that is by interacting with him, spending time with him. You know, come before him and say, God, I've never read the Bible before. Help me. Simple as that. Help me. God, I need your help. Or, God, I don't understand this. Come talk to me about it or talk to others about it. But without addressing what you believe, your actions won't follow suit. And God's will for our lives is to be sanctified, to be like Jesus. That's what sanctification really means. The end product is, is like Jesus. And if you are growing in that relationship, praise be to the Lord. But if you're not, then like, what, what can I do to help? That's really why I'm, what I'm, the Bible says, literally it says in the book of Ephesians, that my job, my role is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So I'm to equip you guys to do the work of ministry. What is ministry? Well, my definition is partnering with God to bring, to bring the kingdom, his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Are you bringing God's kingdom into your workplace? Are you bringing God's kingdom into your family, into your children's lives, into your grandchildren's lives, into your great-grandchildren's lives, and so on? Are you bringing the kingdom of God into the relationships that you have? That's, or even more so, take a step back. Are you more like Jesus today than you were, were last week? or the week before, or last year, or the year before, or, or when you first became a follower of Jesus. When, as I, my testimony is short, long story short, I, I grew up in the church, was dragged to church, never had a relationship with God. I knew all about God. But then when I was finally confronted with who God was, with him being holy and me not, I had to make a choice. And I, I surrendered my life. I submitted my life to him and his purposes and his plans. And the re I never imagined that I was going to be a pastor. All I did was take one step of obedience. Each step of obedience led me to here. And, and don't get me wrong, there was a lot of, of, of my personal flesh and, oh, I think God wants this for my life. And, and stepping out of his path and, and make, yeah, making it harder, but... I'm here today. And each of us have that journey. But all, all this to say is that God has a plan for your life, and he wants to help you fulfill that, to bring forth his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And as you partner with him, as you grow in your relationship with him, okay, you're going to find joy. Joy is going to bubble out of your heart, out of the simple things that you're like, oh, wow, I never expected that. For your children or your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren to say, you know, I believe in God and I believe that Jesus did this and this and then he has called me unexpected joy. It's like, wow. Because, because as, as I shared during the announcement period, our, our brother in Christ 
Harold Zane died this past week. Each and every person in this room is going to die, myself included. But ultimately, as we're going to talk about um, next week, I believe, next week, okay, what's after that? We'll talk about that. So what's after death here on earth? And, and that's a reality that each of us need to. And if you're not confident, you can't say that, oh, I'm going to be with Jesus. Then we need to talk. We need to talk because there can be a confidence there, an assurance of our salvation that Jesus promises us real life and that I'm going to have that with him when I die. And when you have that confidence, it's easy to share with others. And then you want that for your family and your friends. That's how it works. Simple as that. Wakarimas? Yeah, everybody got it? Okay, let's, let us pray. Lord, we just thank you for this gift of life that we have through your son, Jesus the Christ. Through his sacrifice on the cross, we are able to come before you. And, and I give you all the praise and glory. I thank you for my brothers and sisters here and their relationship with you. We thank you that you meet us exactly where we are in our opala and in our, in our selfishness. But you love us too much, Lord, to leave us here. You have more for us. That more is your holiness. So continue your good work in us and through us. I pray for my brothers and sisters who are not able to make it here. I pray for uh, the Zain Ohana and all those who are sick. We pray for healing in Jesus' name. Even here in this sanctuary, be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed. We pray all these things through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Amen and amen.